God for that. Well, this morning, we're going to talk to you about a sermon, and Pastor Foreman wanted me to come and uh, talk to the students, and uh, also, even it's not just the students, but everybody in here, and the title of the message this morning is, But Continue Thou. I don't know what I just did. But Continue Thou. So what's the title of the message this morning? All right, so I teach junior church, and so I have to have the same rules for them as I do you. We've got to sit up straight, feet in the floor, hands your lap, no talking, except what I ask you to, okay? So we're going to have a great time this morning. We're going to learn something from God's Word, and it's good to have you here. So if you smile and say amen and respond, I preach quicker, and I'm not as long. <laughs> but if you stand there or sit there and look like a bump in a pickle, you're going to be here at 3 o'clock. So it's really on you this morning that we get something from God's Word. But continue thou. Now, I love the New Testament, of course. I love the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul was writing to his friend, his, uh, his son in Christ, Timothy. Now, you have to understand something. When Paul is penning these words, he knows what's coming. He's in a Roman prison. He's chained up. And he's well aware that he's coming out feet first. In other words, he's going to die in prison and he knows it. And so he knows that his time is short. And so Paul is going to write to his friend in Christ, and he's going to give him some instruction, just like I am you this morning. So graduates, where are you at? Raise your hand so I can see you. If you're a senior in high school, raise your hand. Nice and high. Higher, higher. Or going to college, one or the other, whatever works. Okay, there you are. That's good. If you're a senior, raise your hand. No, don't do that. All right. So Paul is writing. Now, we know that Paul has quite the resume, do we not? Someone kind of wrote this paraphrase of 2 Corinthians. I want you to listen to Paul. He said, I worked harder than anyone else. I've been beaten, thrown in jail. I've been at death's door more times than I can count. Five times the Jews whipped me, 39 lashes, five times. The Romans beat me three times with rods. I was hit over and over and over again with rocks. Three different times the ship I was in crashed. In one of those shipwrecks, I spent a night and a day in the open sea. Paul says, hey, listen to me. You think you've had it rough. You think you've got it tough. You listen to me now. I've got a right to tell you what you should do with your life because I've been down that road. You think you're tough? You think because you've had it rough? I know what rough is like. You think serving God is all gummy bear and lollipops? I'm here to tell you it's not. We think sometimes we do what's right. God's going to give us a spiritual cookie. That's not how it always works. If you don't believe me, just read the second half of Hebrews chapter 11. He says, I've taken many, many long trips, and it wasn't easy. I had to swim across rivers, fight off robbers, struggles with relationships, debate friends and foes. Paul says, I've been in dangers in the cities and deserts and countryside. I've been betrayed by people I thought were my friends. You listen to me. I've been there. I know what it's like. You can do it. He says, I've, had, I've known hard work. It's painful and grueling. There have been long and lonely nights without sleep. Pastor Foreman, can you relate? I can. If you had it, I can't believe they said that to me. I can't believe they said that to my wife. I can't believe they called my kids that. I can't believe that. You ever been there? You ever can't sleep? You ever wonder to yourself, is it worth it? I've missed more meals than I can remember. I've been cold, boiling hot. I've been exposed to weather conditions that you can and cannot imagine. And all that's just the beginning. Just the beginning. Yeah, I was a pastor. I pastored many churches. And I had the daily pressure of those churches. When someone hurts, I'm hurt. When someone's stressed and confused, I can be stressed and confused. I felt the depression in my spirit 
When someone falls into sin, an angry fire burns in my gut. It bothers me, Paul said. But the best part about the Apostle Paul's life, and we're going to look at that, is he kept going on. He kept going on. He kept going on. He kept going on. I'm here to tell you this morning, people, wherever you're at, young people, you listen to me, don't you quit. The world is full of quitters. I cannot stand quitters. Stop quitting. Stop quitting on God. Stop quitting on yourself. Adults, we say things like, well, these young people today, oh, where is where this world going? Hey, look in the mirror, person. Look in the mirror. What are you doing for God? You know, God's challenging me, and boy, be careful when you challenge God. I asked God the other day, and I was reading scriptures, and the verse, you hear the verses in the Bible that I don't understand, those aren't the ones that bother me. The ones that bother me are the ones that I do understand. And the Bible says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. And I, I, I asked God, when was the last time David Weirich did something that was impossible if I didn't have God helping me? So I said, God, maybe you should show me. He has. You talk about the windows of trials and tribulations opening up. But guess what God is every single time? He's faithful. He's faithful. And I've asked God specifically for something. I said, God, it would be impossible for this to work out. I asked our church people, would you pray about this? It will be impossible if God does it. But praise God, if it happens, we can look around and say, it was God. Young people, adults, listen to me. Ask God to do the impossible through you. You know why sometimes God isn't moving? We're not asking. We're not willing. We don't want to be on the firing line. We don't want to feel the pressures of the world. It's not Democrats or Republicans. It's not the president or the vice president. It's churches not doing what they're supposed to do. That's the truth, and that'll preach. We're not continuing the thing we should be doing. We're not continuing. So Paul is writing to Timothy. He says in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 14 and 15 says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Students, continue. Continue. If you have a good church, guess what? You know the scriptures. You have the whole Bible. You have it. There's no excuse not to know what God wants you to do. No excuse. There's more technology today than there's ever been. If you have a smartphone, you have the key to the Bible, to commentaries, to preaching 24-7 if you wanted it. There's no reason, no excuse not to know him. None whatsoever. Well, I don't read very good. Then just let your phone talk to you. It'll talk to you as long as that battery holds up. And once the battery dies, plug it in. But continue. But continue. So this morning, very briefly, I want to talk about three areas we should continue in. Three areas we should continue in. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Lord, forgive me of the many things that I think, say, and do that break your law. I want to be pure before you today. Give me words of wisdom. Help me to be compassionate in Christ's name, amen. All right, number one, continue in truth. Go ahead, write it down, make a note, have it in your mind, continue in truth. So our message title is, But Continue Thou. What's the message title? Okay, that was great, all four of you. The message title is? All right, point number one is continue in truth. Point number one is what? Oh, this is great. I love audience participation. Be persistent in truth. Persistent means quality of being determined to do or choosing to do. A firmness, a purpose. John chapter 8 says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed in him, If you continue my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. 
People are believing lies today and they don't even know it. They don't even know it. Their lives are absolute train wrecks because they don't know what they believe or why they believe it or they believe whatever the news tells them or the truth to them changes from day to day. I'm here to tell you the truth does not change. It's always been what God's word says, always. Proverbs 23, 23 says, buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom, instruction, and understanding. We know that wisdom is practical knowledge. Have you ever been around someone that just doesn't seem to know anything? I tell my pastor, I said, what I don't understand is the order I get, it seems some people, it doesn't occur to them that should, it, it should occur to them. I'm like, I can't believe you just said that. I can't believe you just did that. I can't believe you think that way. So it's practical knowledge. Instruction is moral, cultural discipline. <clears throat> and you have to excuse me, I have terrible allergies. I promise I do not have COVID, in case you're wondering. <laughs> Understanding, it's discernment. It's, it's knowing in my mind what I believe. So I'm here to tell you there's an absolute standard for truth as we continue in truth, and it is the Bible. It is God's word. It is the Bible. The Bible is the truth. It's the moral compass by which Christians should live. But I'm here to tell you I'm 48 years old, and I've never seen in my life a time when people no longer believe the Bible. You know why? They don't really know it. They've never put it in their heart and determined that this is what I'm going to believe and why I'm going to believe it, because the Bible says that. Because the Bible says it. Many people today are trying to blur the lie between right and wrong, between truth and a lie. Can I tell you something? You can know the truth. You can. You don't have to walk around blinded by the truth. Students, every Christian should have these things in their life, my opinion. Okay? Number one, a life verse. My life verse is Jude 22, and of some have compassion, making a difference. And so the older I get, the more that I try to take that life first, and then it determines how I live my life. It determines how I spend my money. It determines how I do what I do, compassionate and what I do in my actions. It's all God's money anyways. It's all God's time anyways. And now God's giving me that verse, and I try to act that way. I try to teach junior church that way in a compassionate way. And when little Johnny acts up and little Susie acts up, I try to be compassionate. And I try to remind myself, oh, they weren't raised in church. They have a split home. They don't have a mom and dad at all. And I try to remember that. And I talk to people. And sometimes radio listeners will call, and they'll talk to me and talk to me and talk to me. Then I realize I'll have to tell my wife I won't make it home for dinner because I talked to someone on the phone for quite a while. But you know what? you got to be compassionate. People need help. You have a life verse, and your life verse may change. When I was at Pensacola Christian College, my life verse was Luke 18, 27. And he said the things that turn possible with men are possible with God. Because believe me, English to me was impossible at the time. And then it was Greek. And then it was some sort of algebra class, I was, math I was taking. I told God, this is impossible. You've got to help me. And he did. And he did. Students, have a life verse. You should at any bit of time, someone looks at you and says, what's your life verse? You should be able to quote it. Young man in the back, you should have a life verse. You should know it. You should be able to memorize it and say it any time. This is my life verse. Here it is. Every Christian in here should have a life verse. If you don't, work on it this afternoon. Tell the Lord, I want to get a life verse. And you memorize it and you have it. Put it on a three by five card. Put it on your phone. Put it in your pocket. Read it all the time. Why not? Have a life verse. Number two, have a favorite Bible character. Have a favorite Bible character. You study that. Mine would be two or three or four. Right now, it's Joseph, the Apostle Paul. Joseph, what a man of God. What things we can learn from him. Learn, read it over and over and over again. Finally, have a favorite book of the Bible. Mine is probably James, the, New Te the Proverbs of the New Testament, I can't tell you how many times I've read it. I love the book of James. I love to study the book of James. I've read books about the books of James. Listen to me. Know what you know by reading and reading and reading again. Students, have a, a life verse. Have a favorite Bible character. Have a favorite book of the Bible. So David, why do you say that? Because students today are not studying God's word. They're not. They're not. You study God's word. You have a reason to study God's word. You know why you're studying God's word, and God starts speaking to you to know what you know through his word. Students don't sell the truth. 
Don't do it. Don't do it for relationships. Don't do it for material things. Your conviction should not move from day to day. Now I'm about to make a statement that's very unpopular. You'll probably take me off of your Christmas card list. That's fine. I don't think Christians should drink alcohol. I've never had a drop of alcohol in my life. I don't think Christians should drink. I think the Bible is very clear and the principles in it. Students, look at me. Don't drink alcohol. Don't do it. Make it a, make it a conviction that you're not going to do it. Even if your clown friends do or everyone else do, you don't do it. Don't do it. Decide that where I'm not going to be at this person's house after a certain time of night. I'm not going to do it. It's a bad idea. Don't do it. You should decide. Here, here's another thing. Are you ready? Have a conviction. I'm not going to be on my phone all the time. I see students, it's like they can't go more than 14 seconds without looking at your phone. Sometimes I'm old-fashioned and I'm weird, and I know that. I'll take my phone, I'll actually close it up, and I'll put it behind me so I can't see it. Because I'm obsessed, I have to have my phone. Why? Have convictions, have something about you, what you believe in, why you believe in it. I've been convicted about my weight recently. So I've been trying to walk four or five miles a day, going on about two months now. Now, I don't do it every single day, but most of the time I do, because I'm getting tired of looking like Blimpy the Cow. <laughs> and also I realize it's, it's affecting my health. So David, how can you serve God if you have health problems? Guess what? You can't. And it affects how much hours I can put in. It affects how I can reach people. So God's been convicting me about that. Now, I love donuts. Can I get a witness? I love donuts. I could eat a donut right now. I could eat the donut right in front of you, and I wouldn't feel bad about it one bit. Are donuts wrong? Of course not. Better not be. They're going to be in heaven, I'm convinced. You know, students, I've been at Harvest since 1998, and I've seen a lot of kids. Your kids now to me anyways. They're not church anymore. Don't even go. Why? They sold the truth. They sold the truth for a lie. They listened to the devil. How do I know the devil's lying? Every time he opens his mouth. And so we chose to believe that working all those extra hours would be better for me because I got a better down payment and I can have more things. No, no, you won't. You won't be any happier. Believe me, you won't be. I had a job one time. I was making huge money. I had three weeks paid, 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 paid vacation. I got all kinds of paid holidays. I never worked a weekend. I had a 401k and a pension. I was doing very well. And was I happy? No. No. My wife was, had a very good job. She made more money than I did. And when we had our kids, she decided it'd be best if she quit her job. And I changed jobs, and we cut our income by about 70%. I'm here to tell you, was it rough? Oh, my father was rough. But we made it. We made it. Don't sell the truth. Don't sell it. The apostle Paul says, look, I have been there. Timothy, don't sell the truth. Students, don't sell the truth. David, why are you so passionate? I went by someone's house of a young person that I used to take to church a young man, and his house had three or four police cars over it. Last time I talked to him, he had three or four kids by three or four different girls. You know why? He sold the truth. He sold the truth. Don't sell the truth, students. Don't give up on the truth. Decide right now, if God's for it, so am I. Decide right now, if God's against it, so am I. How do I know that? By reading your Bible, by being in it. Buy into the truth of the gospel, embrace it, your godly heritage, hold on to the Christian life, and don't forsake it. Continue in truth. Continue in truth. Continue in truth. Continue in truth. I know that I work for a clean air radio station. We have radios on in our home all the time. We actually have old-fashioned radios, the kind that you plug in the wall and turn them on. And they're on all the time. Why? Just truth. Truth. Preaching, music, truth, all the time. There's one on our garage all the time. Sometimes in the morning, I'll come home for lunch, and my boys' radio will be on. Listen to the old-fashioned music of clean air. It's just truth. 
It's just true. Keep it all the time. All the time. So point number one, continue in truth. Point number two, continue in right thinking. Continue in right thinking. Philippians chapter two says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So continue in right thinking. Right thinking. What is right thinking? Not just positive thinking, but Christ-like thinking. That's where it's at, Christ-like thinking. Stop expecting everyone around you <laughs> to hold your hand spiritually and walk life with you. Seniors, students, it's time to stand up on your own two feet and walk with the Lord's help. We've got young people in our church, 23, 24 years old, still not doing anything, still not serving the Lord, still sloughing at church late, sloughing early. And I'm thinking to myself, man, it's time. It's time to get busy for God. It's time to start doing something for God. Students, look at me. I know you think you're busy, and maybe you are. Maybe you are. Busy doing God's work or busy doing the devil's work? See, there's only two choices on the shelf, serving God and serving self. What are you doing for God? What are you doing for him? If you're able to play an instrument, play it. If you're able to sing, sing. If all you can do is open the door, do it for God. If you can mow the lawn, mow the lawn for God. If you can clean a toilet, clean a toilet for God. If you can run a vacuum, run a vacuum for God. Why can't it? Honestly, the Bible says to send forth war, what? Laborers. And it's a right thinking. It's not my life. It's God's life. And I'm going to do something for him. I'm going to work for him. I'm going to stay busy for him. I guarantee if Pastor Foreman asked for volunteers after church in here, most of you would stare at him like at a calf looking at a new gate. But if I ask my junior church, all I have to say is I need a volunteer. Every hand of the class goes up practically. And then if I act like I don't see him, they start going out further. You know what I'm talking about. And eventually it's like, oof. And then eventually at the end, and then eventually it's me, me, pick me. Why isn't young people doing things for the Lord like they did when I was a kid? Because they stopped listening. Because adults stopped listening. Volunteer for the food pantry once a month. Volunteer to clean the auditorium once a month. It ain't going to hurt you. It ain't going to hurt you. What's it going to cost you? 30 minutes? An hour? Stop picking apart the church all the time. What is that? Negative thinking. You know what it really is? It's stinking thinking. We always act like we got it together. I love you, beloved. No, you don't, because I don't. Sometimes I'm selfish. Sometimes I have a bad attitude. Sometimes I don't want to do it. And what kind of thinking is it? That's devil thinking. Get busy for God. Serve him. Say, man, get this guy off the platform. He's tearing me apart. I'm here to tell you, do something for God. Do something for him, students. I used to go on bus visitation every Saturday morning, and all I did is I stood there. That's all I did. I didn't really, you know, knock on a lot of doors. I didn't witness a bunch of people. I was 12, 13 years old, about my son's age, and I just stood there like a bump of a pickle. But I was there every Saturday with my youth pastor. Junior church, I volunteered, and all I did was give kids a piece of candy at the end. That's all I did. That's all I did. I didn't have to be entertained. I didn't have to be told. And then as I got older, I started to do more things. I started to get involved more. Nate Griner, young person, got saved. Young, uh, Nate Griner is now a deacon in our church. You know why Nate Griner is a deacon in our church? Because Sunday night came around. Guess what Nate, where he was at Sunday night? Anybody want to guess? Class? He was in church. Wednesday night, guess where he was at? Class? Church. Next Wednesday, guess where he was at? Church. Revival. Church. Missions conference. Church. No surprise, guess where Nate's at today? He's in church. Guys, it's not rocket science. Well, there's nothing to do for young people. Start it. I did. I started a basketball league afterwards. I, started, I said, hey, let's get together on Sunday nights. I said, hey, let's start doing visitation together. We'll meet on Tuesday nights. Let's go. Hey, let's go to the nursing homes. I did it. You can do it, students. It's not impossible. You can do it. My wife started playing the church piano when she was 16 years old. 16 years old at Harvest, helping out, playing the choir, doing something. 
We're always asking students for someone to do stuff. You be that person to do it. You be that person to do it. I know what? When it's time for afterwards at 2 o'clock, do you think those chairs are going to get cleaned up themselves? Do you think that table is going to get cleaned up itself? Do you think that trash is going to take it away itself? I, I cannot stand sometimes afterwards they have a big fellowship meeting and there'll be 400 people there and everyone's standing around. You see some guy's got like two tables and two chairs. He's trying to push a trash can and they're like, man, that looks, that's a lot of work. I'm like, why don't you help us, Gus? Come on up. Now maybe you physically can't do it anymore. Pastor Foreman said it before and I believe it. Why don't you set your, you're, you're like me. I, need, I, I got some pains. I can't sleep in anymore. About 5.30, 6 o'clock, I'm up. Grab a cup of coffee. Get on your knees if you're able. Get in your couch and pray for the pastor. You're retired? Pastor Foreman, I'm going to come. Church starts at 7, 7 o'clock, 6. What time does church start here Wednesday night? 7. Is this for me? Oh, praise God. Woo. Say, you know, Pastor, I'm going to get here at 6. I'm going to walk the chairs and pray for you. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be amazing if three or four older folks just walked around praying? Wouldn't it be amazing if Pastor come up here and there's some people right here praying for him? Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't it be amazing if you had your prayer list out and there are six or seven or eight or nine people that maybe you can't get out like you used to, and you can't walk out like you used to, and maybe you can't sing, and maybe you can't play the piano, and maybe you can't do all the stuff you used to do, and your back hurts you, you can't run the vacuum, but you can pray. And I'm here to tell you, we can shake the walls of Norwalk, Ohio, if some people just got a hold of God and said, I want to continue in right thinking. I want to continue in truth. I want to pray for the pastor. I want to pray for Norwalk. Come on, young people, adults, what are you going to do for God? Can I ask you a question? When you stand before God and you have given ability and talent and you could do something for God and you didn't do it, what will you say when you stand before the king? What will you tell him? I was too busy. I, 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 I didn't want to. What will you tell him? <laughs> You're going to have to someday. Someday we'll give an account. Get involved in ministry. Unpack your bags, buckle down, and serve God. Christ thinking is right thinking. Right thinking is not negative thinking. You ever been around a negative person? They're no fun. I appreciate Pastor Lewis. He's Pastor Emeritus of Harvest. He was there for 44 years. He is the most positive thinking person I have ever been around in my entire life. When people, he said, I'm going to write a bus ministry. They said, you can't do a bus ministry in Clyde. Anybody want to guess what he did? Bus ministry. He said, I'm going to do a Christian school. They said, you'll never get a Christian school in Clyde. Anybody want to guess what we have to this day? A Christian school. When they say we start a radio station, a radio station, you're not going to start a radio station in Clyde. You'll starve to death. We now have four radio stations. You know what that is? Positive thinking. God said, he, if God's for it, so am I. Continue in right thinking. Don't sit back all the time. And remember of all the times that you've been treated unfairly and all the times you've been wronged. And you may have been. You may have been. It's time to forget about that and move on. It's time to reach for God. It's time to get behind it. Continue in right thinking. Continue in the truth. Continue in it. Last point, continue in right choices. Continue in right choices. Joshua 24, 15 says, that if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You have to make a choice every day to serve God. Every single day. Every single day. Now, if you saw me driving to work someday, you would think that I am clinically insane. Because I have full-fledged conversations in my truck full-fledged conversations. 
I not only talk, I answer myself. <laughs> True story. I talk with my hands. I'll go all kinds of things. I embarrass my sons. Sometimes a good song comes on, and I'll absolutely crank it up as loud as I can, especially if there's, like, young ladies around. I'll roll down the window and yell out and say things. The boys get embarrassed. They climb underneath. It's the best thing in the world. But the conversation I'll have sometimes is, devil, you're not going to do that to me this morning. I'm not going to be in a bad mood. You're not going to nope, I'm not thinking about that devil. I'm not going to think about that negative thought. I'm not going to think about what that person said. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to do it. God, you got to help me today. you got to fill me with your spirit today. Lord, I'm giving this day to you. I want to serve you, God. I want to do what's right. How can I get on the air and talk to people about living for God? If I'm not living for God, you got to help me, Lord. And I'll have full-fledged conversations. And some of you need to have that conversation with yourself, even right now. I want to do something for God. I want to make right choices. Here's your choices, to be saved or lost. That's a choice. There's really two types of people in this room. Those who are saved and those who are not. And there's no in between. There's no in between. You either know the Lord as your Savior or you don't. You're either saved or you're not. Will you choose to be saved today? Here's another one. The choices are to be spiritual or carnal. Once again, there is no in between. You're either living for the Lord or you're not. There is no 10-yard line in Christianity. You're either on the 50-yard line, you're in the game, or you're not. There's no bench warmers for God. You're either to be scriptural or logical. You know what God's Word says. It's not that, like I said before, it's not the, the Bible verses that maybe I'm not quite sure about. It's the ones that I do know. To be safe in God's Word and God's will or to be risking your own will. That's your choice. David, what's God's will? I'm glad you asked, okay? Number one, are you ready? You're fulfilling God's will this morning. Go to church. That is God's will. The enti- think about it. The entire New Testament was either written about the church or for the church. The entire New Testament. Even Revelation, the first couple of chapters talk about the seven churches. So the, the entire New Testament is either written by a pastor or to a pastor or about a church. The four Gospels were about Jesus, who was the start of the church. And Acts was about the start of the church. So who is church's idea? God's or man's? God's. So going to church is God's will. We know that's God's will. I don't have to ask about that. We know to pray. We know praying is God's will. We know it is God's will to pray. Students, I want to know God's will for my life. Go to church and pray. That is God's will. The Bible says that. For this is the will of God. Many times the Bible. We also know to read your Bible. That is God's will. God's word was not written to the unsaved. God's word was written to the saved. So reading your Bible is God's will. David, I want to know God's will in my life. Go to church, pray, read the Bible. That is God's will for your life. Also God's will. Are you ready? Be thankful. Be thankful. Have a good, good heart. So many people I've seen fall into sin. It starts with an unthankful heart. Crabby patty, mad about everything, stinking thinking. Maybe we need a check up from the neck up. Have a good attitude and be thankful. That is God's will. It's God's will. God's will to be thankful. Seriously. When you go to Walmart or you go to Myers or you go to whatever, be as nice as you possibly can to that checkout person and thank them over and over again. Why? They might be more apt to take a track. When, when I, we go to tip uh, at a restaurant, believe it or not, not that I'm, you know, Daddy Warbucks or something, but I give big tips for one reason and one reason only, because they always leave a gospel track, always. I thought to myself, they might be more apt to read it if I leave a huge tip. And I'm thankful. I thank them. Almost, I try every time they fill up my water or whatever they give me to tell them thank you. When someone holds the door for me, I try to tell them thank you. When someone lets me out in traffic, I try to tell them thank you. What, like they can really hear you? It's an attitude. It's a thought. It's just being thankful. Students, I want to know God's will. Go to church, pray, read your Bible, be thankful. Here's another one. Are you ready? Tell others about Christ. That is God's will. That is absolutely, positively, 100% God's will that we witness to other people. That is God's will. That's why we're still here. Okay? So students, I don't know God's will. What I want to do for my life, pray. Read your Bible, go to church, 
be thankful, witness, bring glory to God. That is God's will. If God has not taken you home, in other words, ready? You're still breathing. You're here to bring glory to God. That is God's will for your life. That's God's will for your life. Sometimes we act like, you know, David, I, I don't know what to do. And I don't, what I want God to do in my life, and I don't know. Read your Bible, pray, go to church, be thankful, witness, bring glory to God. If you do those things, guess what you're doing? You're doing God's will. And then eventually, ready? Mom, dad, students, parents, young adults, old fogies. I don't, I don't know what else to call you. Grandparents. That's okay. The kids think I'm old, so I feel your pain. Then you start doing God's plan. We act like God's will is a destination. It's not. It's a journey. It's a journey. Doing God's will every day. And when you're doing God's will, then you start to fulfill his plan. You don't read your Bible. You don't pray. You don't go to church. You don't witness. You're not thankful. You're not bringing him glory. You're not going to be doing God's plan. You're just not. So once you do those things, so we continue in truth. There is absolute right and wrong. There is things that the Bible says we should not be doing, and they're crystal clear in the Bible. We are crystal clear. We should be right thinking. I think the right way. If I'm going to do something, I'm not going to do it if I don't think about it. It starts right here in the mind. And then I continue with right choices. Okay? Now, I'm going to blow up the auditorium here in about one minute. Here's a, here's a big statement. Are you ready? Here we go. No rocks. Don't throw your cell phones at me. Young people, I get a drink of water because it's going to be powerful. Hold on. I would never date an unsafe person. Never. Never. Every date's a potential mate. I would not do it. Wouldn't do it. I don't care if she's babelicious. I'd never go out with her. Never. I don't care if he's a hunk. Girls, be careful. His hunk eventually turns into a chunk. I'm just telling you. <laughs> if he's not saved, I would not return his text message. I would not go out with him. Don't do it. Don't do it. So I'm not getting Christmas cards for now. I know it. I'm against alcohol and I'm against dating unsafe people. Don't do it, young person. Don't do it. It's bad news. They'll change. No, they won't. What they are now, they always will be. Okay? Yeah, but my aunt, sister's cousin's former roommate on my dad's side, this one, there's always exceptions to the rule. But that's why they're called exceptions. They're not the rule. And you will be the rule. You'll end up train wreck city, messed up life. Well, what if the most person, they could be the most wonderful, kind, gracious person in the world. If they don't get saved, the Bible says, and it gives me no pleasure to say this, they will go to hell someday if they reject God. So here we go. Put your shoes on. We're done. This is it. Okay? A couple more principles. Choose right now that you'll stay close to God. Forget past failures. Forget them. Get forgiveness and move on. Don't dwell while I used to. Get past that. Forgive the people that have hurt you. But David, why? Because you've hurt God. Why did Jesus go to the cross? For my sins. For my sins. Fill the voids in your life with godly things. You want some good fellowship? Hang around Pastor Foreman. Now be sensitive of their time. Don't be calling them at 4 a.m. But be sensitive. Choose right now that you'll love God with all your heart, soul, and mind in your home, in your workplace, in your finances. Choose right now that you'll live for God in your life. The Christian life is the best life. It is. Be excited about the ministry and get busy in it. So continue. So continue in truth, continue in right thinking, continue in right choices. Now, we'll go back to where we started from. The Apostle Paul's resume was, was pretty tough. We think about all that he did and all that happened in his life. But do you know the Apostle Paul is not the only person to suffer for the Lord? But you know why we remember the Apostle Paul? Because he finished. 
you finish. It's not about how you start. It's about how you finish. You may say, you know, David, I mean, I've messed up, man. I, I, was, I was a clown show in high school. I didn't live for God at all. You can live for God now. You can live for God now. You can do something for him now. You can do something for him now. You don't have to wait. You can continue. Continue. Where's Aaron at? The guy was leading the singing. Where are you at? Is he here? There he is. Aaron, how long have you become this church? So years. Years. Do you think it's an accident Aaron is leading singing this morning? Pastor Foreman didn't call up. Aaron, I know I haven't talked to you in 20 years. You want to lead singing this morning? No, he's here because what? He was here for years. You went to Bible college, correct? Is he crowned? They let you go even though Pastor Foreman graduated from there? You know what? What it takes is just living for God. Josh, there are many times at Pensacola Christian College, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. I wanted to quit, and I didn't quit. Whatever you do, don't give them the number 68715 when you get there, whatever you do. That was my student ID in college. Don't quit, Josh. Don't quit. Young lady, don't quit. Young man, don't quit. They're going to want to quit. When you get that D, when you get that demerit, when that teacher goes berserk in your head because you didn't do something right, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Young people, don't quit. Adults, don't quit. Older folks, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Stay for God. Do something for God. Change. Turn Norwalk upside down for God. It starts with the right truth. It starts with the right thinking. It starts with the right choices. Our Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning.